in the beginning. As the water cools is when we start to get these schools of fish down. But this time of year, I mean, if you went by it now, like I said, on uh, Fort Pierce the other day, it was 81 degrees at the sea buoy, but it's November. This time of last year was about 76 or 77. When you start seeing those middle 70s consistently, this fishing will get very consistent. It gets much more consistent. And that's a matter of this stretch from St. Lucie to Fort Pierce, it's not gonna be a matter of if they're here, it's gonna be a matter of where they are. So, I mean, I, I'll get a call from somebody, you know, that's down at, uh, that's down at Fletcher down here by the House of Refuge, and all of a sudden, you hear somebody at Blue Heron, same thing with the current. You get that south current, they, they tend to go with the current, not against it. When we get fronts, they get the fronts from the north, believe it or not, the day before, they usually swim to the front, they swim to the wind. So, all that you start thinking about, but, uh, Temperature-wise, now uh, I don't pay much attention to it. I, I still know it, it's been too warm, and I'm thinking after we get this uh, weather through here, I, I think we're going to we're, we're going to see some good fishing. It has to. I mean, we, nobody's been able to fish since first week of October. Yeah, you know? yeah we, we went a couple weeks ago. I got a couple things in down you know, like two, three days ago. We're down in Juno. Got one, we, got, laid, laid down there we had a decent day in Hope Sound, some whiting, one popping in, kind of first bonefish. Okay, I'll tell you something about bonefish. We have, I've already had a couple days this year where I left the beach because of the bonefish. We were catching them two at a time. And, the, and it's a good problem to have because there's so much fun to catch. But the population of bonefish in our area has gotten permit and bonefish. Uh, I was talking to Pat there before. I mean, I had, before all this weather started, in September, beginning of October, we had, Randy and I had five trips in a row, and we caught permit up to 25 pounds. Usually that was a spring thing, but we had clean water, and if you see the permit, they, they gotta have clean water. So do the bonefish. But the bonefish, hey, who sound in the spring? That's where we got it. I, I don't want to say they're a nuisance because it's a game fish, but we a couple days we did we left yeah. because you you they're so fast you can't get a you can't get a bait to them you're not going to catch anything with bonefish. But our population I mean it's a fun fish to catch, and the only thing that I, I caution people on, you know you you're catching them on a 12 foot rod you're not catching them on a fly rod so that first run usually the first one is because there's some used to be little ones well there's not there's some decent sized ones now that 12 footer goes over. You get a good run, you think, ah, that's two pound pompano right there. And then once that line goes down the beach a little bit and it kind of stops, bonefish. You know, it's bonefish. Yeah, mine, the one we got, it picked it up and ran, and I thought it got broke off by something. Yeah. Because it was just slack. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, there's something on here. And it was a little bonefish. The problem with them, and I, they die very easily. You've got to get them off. I tell people, especially if I have a charter, let's get them off the hook quick. Get your picture. Let's get them back in because there are times when you got to revive them. And it, I don't want to kill a bonefish under any certain terms, but they're fun to catch. But the permit and the bonefish, they like clear water. You might not have the best pompano day, but you're going to have some fun reeling fishing because, like you said, that first run on that bonefish, ooh, man, they smoke it. Especially if you get a bigger one. You know what I mean? That's well, we cooked up our first whiting recently too. Okay, I'll tell you about the whiting this year. <laughs> we had a run right in the beginning of October when it was fishable here in the Mid-Island area. We have two kinds of whiting here. We have a southern kingfish and we have a gulf kingfish. Kingfish is a whiting. It's, we have to call them whiting, but they're actually, their real name is kingfish. But the southern, they're bigger, and they have some brown markings down their side. The gulf actually has, usually you'll, they're bright silver and they have a black spot on the tail and they don't get as big as the southerns. We were catching, and we would catch a southern whiting here. You know, you catch one, two, three during, you know, on a day, this, the, well, we were getting 20 and 25 of them, but they were enormous. We were getting them up to about 17 inches, two at a time. 
we had them here and we had them here for I'll bet you for two weeks. Where, where this school or this body of fish came from, I don't know. And I got 15 or 16 last weekend on the beach and only had one of them. Everything else were the, were the gulf, the, our normal silver ones that just don't get as big. But the, Do they both have whiskers? Yes, I mean, they're, they're, they look the same, but when you bring them out of the water, one is bright silver and one has these, they're kind of light brown markings down the side of them. And the other thing you can tell, unless you ice them, the bigger ones right away, they tend to get a little softer when you, they taste fine. But the, but the uh, uh, gulf, the silver ones with the black spot, they're a little firmer. And yeah, we threw a couple back because they had a spot. I'm like, that's not a waiting. <laughs> yeah, they got a black spot on the top. Yeah. And they're unregulated. Now, I usually, my rule of thumb with them is, pop it off. If it's 11 inches, I'm going to keep it. If it's, you know, because you, you can catch them during the summer. We'll catch them here. We'll get them six, seven, eight little guys, and we just keep throwing them all back. What do you want to fillet? Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. Because we have, kind of build small I'm like, I don't feel like playing that. Yeah, those, those little guys. I mean, they're unregulated. You can keep whatever you want. But... When they, they're 11 inches, you know, you get a sandwich out of it. There's no question about that. But, and I will tell you from a personal standpoint, as far as table fare, you put that pompano and you put that whiting, uh, I'm gonna, a little hard pressed there to tell you which one I, I'd rather eat. Now, pompano is a little lighter meat, a little sweeter tasting. But boy, those, man, my wife makes them and puts them on sliders. I'll tell you what, I'll kill you for one of them for whiting. So they're, they're excellent, but we we have a great this year. The long rods are catching a lot. You know, normally you don't want to go past that first trough for the whiting and croaker. And all summer we do that. They're right at your feet. All these real big whiting we've been catching, they're all in a pompano rod. They're staying in the deeper water. Every once in a while you'll get a couple. You know, I when we were catching them, I set one rod at about 40 yards, maybe 50 yards instead of 70 or 80. And we were catching them on air, but the biggest ones, double headers, just like your pompano fishing. And you know with Sam because when you hook a pompano, the tip of your rod's going down. You you're gonna know what's going on there. You know it's a pompano. The whiting, I call them tipper tappers. You know you see that movement, and they'll actually pull the rod down a little bit. And when you pick it up, there's weight on it, but it's not a pompano. A lot of times when you hook a pompano out that far. You'll see your line almost come to the surface, and you'll see them skip sometimes. They'll actually skip on top of the water. Bluefish will do the same, but the pompano will actually skip a little bit on top of the water. When I see the line come up, it's probably a pompano, where the whiting have a tendency to stay down in the water. And it's, let's face it, it's, you're not using a 12-footer for the fight value of the whiting. You're fighting to get them into the cooler so you can take them home and eat them. I mean, that's, that's what that's all about. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're delicious fish. Just Do you need the permit? Too? No, I, I pretty much, if I, on a rare occasion, if I get a little one, you know, I, I get, you know, we had them, we had them up to 25 pounds there in October, and I'm not keeping them. They're, I, they're, they're too big a game fish. They're going back. They're going back. And a lot of times, even the permit, uh, they'd have to be, you know, small enough, almost like a pompano, a real tiny one. I haven't kept one in some time because I, I just like this. You know. Mm -hmm. What do you like on tides? I'm sorry. What do you like for tides? Do you care? Do okay, you this time of year. Things change here. Depends on the time of year. This time of year, best pompano bite is usually a morning bite. So, but if you can get the morning, early morning with a high tide, anywhere up to about 10 o'clock, I'm on the beach at first light because that as the tide comes up you're going to get you should get good activity because they like that early morning bite and usually i don't care where i'm fishing whether it's dead low or dead high on the change of tide i'm not leaving for about an hour when the tide changes because once that tide changes you might not be catching anything but once that tide changes and that water movement starts to change a little bit boy that can go like a switch Winter, early morning, after we go to daylight saving time in March, it'll switch and the best bite for the pompano's in an afternoon, afternoon high tide. Morning high tide during the winter, afternoon high tide during the spring.
you you tend to catch more. And actually, down your way, I mean, during the spring, like I said, I was lucky enough to have a spot to fish on Jupiter Island, and we uh, well, we had some days there in the, in the afternoon this year that was just crazy. Fish. North or south of Buffalo Sound? Oh, yeah. North? Uh, well, yes, yes and no. My private spot is to the south. It's down, you know, it's probably mile and a half down. But the public beach where you walk on, now you know that Hope Sound's got that reef out there. If you go north, you gotta walk a little bit. And I, I don't like going to the refuge because it gets too crowded. There's just too many people fishing there. And But if you go north, that reef actually comes in at a certain area. And where that reef comes in, which is probably a quarter of a mile up the beach, all the way up to around a corner, that north area is good. And I, I truly believe it's because they have that worm rock there, but that reef actually has a break in it up there. So I, if I'm gonna fish a public beach, not my public spot, that's where I'm going. I'm going, I'm going to the north, I'm going to the north. But Hope Sound, Hope Sound, that's the place in the spring. I mean, you're there almost every day because we're getting fish that come up from the south, they come out of the Gulf, they come around a corner, and they come up, we're, you know, the fish here are going to migrate too, but there's a pretty big body of fish down here, and that's why most commercially, Hope Sound in the spring is the place where we almost start every, almost every day down that way. It's a, it, there's some great beaches down here. Well, wintertime, you like it up here. Yeah, I like it up here. And if, the closer you get to Fort Pierce, the beaches get deeper. You get Middle Cove's a little filled in now. Uh, because of all the storms and wind we've had, but once you get north of Middle Cove, you know, you got Frederick Douglass has some rocks, then you got John Brooks, then you got Blue Heron, then you got Coconut, then you got Porpoise. You can fish those beaches to the north at dead low tide. Down here at dead low, Tiger Shores, Normandy, uh, County Line, all these at dead low, there's no water. There's water there. If you could only, you had three hours to fish and it was dead low tide, you want to fish to the north because you got plenty of water. Plenty of water. Yeah, there's been a big bar shift here. Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, lots yeah. of sand now. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, what's happened here is crazy. And obviously, I haven't had much of a chance to get back out to take a look. If you really want to see what happens to these beaches, take an hour or two. And I've got. In your handout there, I've, I've actually never used to have addresses. All the beaches up around here have, have addresses. So I added the addresses and you can put them in a GPS and it'll take you right there. But what you want to do, you want to take a ride up there at low tide. And what you're going to do, you're looking for wave action. If you've got white water out a quarter of a mile, and right next to that white water, you see where it's starting to crest but it never crests, the water's deep. It could be run out, cut through, you call it whatever you want, but at low tide, you can really see. If you've got all white water for a quarter of a mile at dead low tide, it's all the same bottom. But you will find spots, because I know a couple spots down here at uh, Tiger Shores and also Seward Beach, it's only about 100 yards wide, but boy, that's where I'm setting up. And you can, if you go at low tide, you can see it. It's, it's much high tide, you don't have a chance because, you know, you, you're not going to get all that white water. But you take some time, and I actually have, I have a notebook. I mean, that's how obsessive I am with it. Yeah. I have a notebook, and I will actually, and after a blow like we've had, things are going to change again. I mean, it can change on a storm. It can change overnight. So, but we've had all these sustained easterly winds for so long. Uh, I mean, Blue Heron, that I like to fish up by Fort Pierce Inlet, I walked up there, I don't know, I was looking for sand fleas about a week ago, and that was a nice gradual beach all the way up. Now, some of them you get the big cliffs, big fall off where it's all gone, but all that sand that made that nice gradual was all gone. The sand had to go somewhere. So, whether I have not been back again, but I'm going to... I got to look at them again because if there are areas that filled in, depending on the current, depending on the topography of the bottom, you, I mean you don't know. 
because we got and we got some exposed we got some exposed worm rock now that we never had. For example, we found at uh, County Line the other day. It was never. I never got hung up there. Well, guess what? I got hung up here the other day. Well, I got hung up because that sand washed washed it all away. <laughs> Moons make a difference. I'm sorry. Moons make a difference. Uh, I, I I don't like the full moon. You know, I don't. I'm not a big full moon advocate. Um, and of course, the thought always is they'll eat all night because they can see all night. We tend to get stronger currents during sometimes new moon and the full moon. But the new moon day, you know, that day that it's a, a full moon rather. You know, looking back, you. It could, it's pretty tough fishing some days, and it's the same. I mean, it's look, it's the same thing. You know, if you're trolling for Wahoo, you want to be out there right after that full moon. You know what I mean? So, there's there's different thoughts on that, and I got some guys that say ah, it don't make any difference, but I've got more people that I fish with that do it for a living that don't like it, and I, I just think everything slows down for the pump. You want to talk about some rigs and uh, bait techniques and maybe sure. some setups? Okay, the, the rigs. Now here, I've got, I've got my rigs on here, and I can actually show what makes up what I think. And this store, Freddy's store right here, is one of, is the only local store that has them. And, and, and I'll tell you what the thought process is on the rig. It's 30 pound fluoro. It's a double dropper loop, and I start with about a four foot piece of fluorocarbon. And what we do, we have, uh, there's probably eight, ten inches from the top, eight, ten inches from the bottom. You'll see some pompano rigs that have, you know, might have a hook way up here, and then another one way down here. I like them closer together because, let me ask you, I always ask this at a seminar. What Pompano's favorite food, what, what do they eat? They eat sand fleas, mole crabs, they eat clams, they eat small crabs. Now, I, my question always is, is that crab and sand flea going to be up here? No, it's going to be closer to the bottom. And the other thing is, when I, I like the hooks closer together, if you're more apt to get a double header. This, this will, if they're sight feeders, they see one, they see another, you can catch two. So I like having the hooks together. The other thing is, it makes the leader a little shorter. If you have a real long leader when you're casting, there's going to be more slack in the line because you have more to throw. You have, it's, you're not going to be able to shorten up. Because if you're going to use a swivel, you got you don't want it going through the guides. You can't do that. But a shorter leader will give you a, a longer cast. The other thing I like about the rigs, and and this is something that we could debate forever. And you get ten guys in here, they're going to tell you ten different things. I'm a proponent, and this is Freddie's quote: "Small hooks catch big fish." Give him Freddie all the credit for that. These are actually number one must-add circle hooks. And the reason I like the smaller hook, I am a big fish bite advocate, obviously, and I've gotten to the point where, and there's a bunch of us have gotten to the point, we'll fish either two or three rods with nothing but plain fish bites on them. Now, what happens when I put my fish bite on and I have a smaller hook, I cut a tail in the fish bite. Now, what happens is this is sitting on the bottom, when we have current and we have wave action, if you, you want to hold it in that first trough, if you get some current, it moves. It looks like a tail. It's a little more natural. And if you think that doesn't work, I convinced one guy has been doing it for 35 years, and now you look in his fish bite bag, everyone's pre-cut before he even gets to the beach. It's You're always looking for a little bit of an edge. That tends to provide it. But the smaller hook, if you use like the old 2-0 kale hooks or a bigger circle hook, a 2-0 or a 3-0 circle hook, like some folks use, it will impair the action. The hook's too heavy. So you have a 2-0 or a 3-0 kale on this, this bait is not going to have the same action as it does with a little number one circle hook. And all the permit that I catch, I catch them on these hooks. 
is one of the strongest hooks on the market, and I like a small hook. And the other thing I like about them is when the pompano aren't biting, the whiting and the big croakers, they got small mouths. So if you're using those big 2-0, you might get bit, and you might get that tip-tap on your rod, but you're not going to hook them because they can't get that hook into their mouth. So I am a huge advocate of small hooks because of the fish bites, because of the availability of other species that you can catch. And I just, and I like the fluorocarbon and I like chartreuse. Chartreuse is my favorite couple. This color right here, as far as the float's concerned. Does that go right on your 15 pound test then? I'm sorry? Does that go right on your 15 pound test line? No, this is on 30 no. pound fluorocarbon. I mean, oh yes, yeah. This this is all this is all 15 pounds. Thank you. This is 15 pounds. Unless he's slinging some weight, then he's going to put the heavier well, line on. Well, no, oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood your question. The green is 15 pound. Everything's got a shock leader. I, I don't. It? I don't tie it. I never tie it direct. Okay. I'm sorry. I misunderstood your question. Right. No, everything's got a shock leader. Depending on the length, it could be seven foot. It could be ten foot. It could be eleven foot. It could be one wrap on the reel, it could be no wraps on the reel. And how heavy would that be? 30 pounds. 30. I use 30 pound fluorocarbon for that. And the reason I use fluorocarbon is because George Poveromo, when I first started doing this, said you're in Florida, you use fluorocarbon. You can probably catch them on mono. I, I, I just like fluorocarbon because I like the thought of having a little more, or less visibility in the water is what it comes to. But these, that's what the rigs are. They're 30 pound and... That's fluoro as well. That's yeah, fluoro. fluoro. And, and also uh, what I do with the beads, I always, always use the red bead. It's called a ruby red bead. And the thought process behind that ruby red bead that I have here, and a lot of guys will tell you the same thing. It's the same color as the egg sac on the, uh, on the females. Sand, sand cribs, sand flukes, small cribs. So that's the color. I, I like that. Now, it's funny because chartreuse has always been my number one color for pompano. Red has always been for the whiting and croaker. I tend to do better with that during the summer when I'm fishing for whiting and croaker. To sell any of these rigs, and of course I do sell them through fish bites. The guys up, I sent them some red color floats on pompano rigs, and now they're screaming for them, the red color. So. Will other colors catch them? Of course they will. I just that I've always been a, a chartreuse guy, and I have a tendency, believe it or not, on the red, especially around here, we, we're starting to see quite a few bluefish. For some reason, the bluefish love red. So uh, you tend to catch a few more bluefish on them than, than you will. But they're catching a lot of pompano on the red float from Melbourne to Jacksonville right now. But it's uh, but that's the rig basically, and say small hooks catch big. That's a 60 pound sinker snap, and I'll use either a 40 or a 60 pound swivel on and here, depending on what the availability is. Fish bites as well. Yeah, yeah. Just like that's how you fish. Exactly, and uh, if you look at the, we we've got the pompano rigs over there on the back, and it's also there's a picture in there. Last year, yellow. What they did with the yellow crab, that one you just saw, this color right here. They enhanced it, Fish Bites enhanced it, but it's brighter than it has been. And boy, we just beat the heck out of them on this, on this bright yellow last year. And an Easy Flea is always going to be a Pompano favorite because of the scent and the color. And what I like to do when I use the natural bait, like I have on here, in other words, it's here. Now there's a sand flea, a natural sand flea, with a smaller piece of Fish Bite, but I try to match the fish bite scent with the bait that I'm using. The other one that I have here, that's a, uh, that's a salted clam right there. That's an orange clam fish bite. Match the scent with the bait that you're using. And as far as natural baits are concerned, those are the two favorite clam strips and sand fleas. And I will tell you, if you folks are, if you guys are local here, we get, we're having more soon more sand fleas this year than we've ever seen. Um, they they've been at a lot of beaches a lot of days, um, but the clams the clam strips. I'm from New Jersey. We use big bait clams. 
you couldn't, if you and I sat and tried to pull them apart, we couldn't. That's how tough they are. I remember coming down here to get my first bag of frozen clams. I thawed it out. I picked it up. I thought it was soup. I mean, so what I do with the clam strips, that's, that's the piece. I take the frozen clams, thaw them for about a half an hour so they're not totally thawed out. I then cut into small pieces, put them in an old Tupperware container on a paper towel. Then take a paper towel and damp them down, take some of the moisture out, and then load them with kosher salt. Don't put them back in the refrigerator overnight. Put some tin foil on it or saran wrap. Just leave them in the garage. They won't smell. Leave them in the garage and wait for them to toughen up for the next morning. Once you do that, they will stay on the hook. Much better than the soup clams that we put on that half the time you're casting them off anyway. And the reason that we put the bait on first and then the fish bite, it does two things. Number one, it will actually cushion the bait because how many times do we cast sand fleas or clams? You go that way, but your sand flea goes that way. You cast them right off. What the fish bite allows it to do when it gets on the bend of the hook, it will 75% better chance of that staying on the hook. And the other thing it does when you put the smaller piece of fish bite on, you don't have to use the big strip when you use a natural bait, but when you do that, when you have that on there, if a crab, if in fact a small white inner croaker pecked the natural bait off, chances are the fish bite with that mesh on it is probably still on the hook, so you're still fishing. You're still in the game. Now, will they will they get it off? Yeah, eventually they'll get it off, depending on water temperature and everything else. And, and one of the other biggest problems that, that I have to tell you, no matter what kind of bait you're using, I've seen guys fish next to me that check their bait every 30 or 35 minutes. Not gonna be. My baits get checked every five to 10 minutes because depending on what's going on, and I use for, for the rigs that we have here, I use, these are micro balls, and they're not straight styrofoam. They have a very hard shell on them. If you start bringing in your styrofoam floats, if you make your own rigs, and you see them crushed, and you're saying, boy, that has gotta be a rough bottom. It's not rough bottom. Fish. It's crabs. They love floats. Now, these will get dented, and the, sty the regular styrofoam floats, you're probably gonna get one trip out of them, one day. And there are certain days the crabs are so bad that they won't, styrofoam's going, you, you won't have a float on here. But what I, what I like about these, they're, they're all a bit harder and they're much more durable than the others. And that's, uh, and that's, and believe me, up north where that water is just a little cooler than what we got, they got real crab situations. Well, they love these because they can get a couple trips out of them, you know, two, two three days worth out of them. If it was straight styrofoam, you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. You want to talk rods and reels for a second? Okay. We talk, I talked before to a couple folks. These are long cast spinning reels. Penn has got the market on that. I will tell you there are other brands. There are certainly other brands. But a long cast spinning reel, the spool is taller, it's wider than your standard spinning reel. Now what that does and what that creates is a better what they call line leg. Now they're conventional. When you bring a conventional in, with a level one, you know how nice that line goes back and forth and it lays perfectly on the spool. This is a very slow oscillating reel. It's not something you're gonna go speed jigging with for black fin tuna off the offshore. But what this taller, wider spool does, the line lay is much more uniform and the friction, when you go to cast a long cast spinning reel, you got about 50% less friction coming off of that reel than you would a standard spinning reel. So what's happened, I used to use conventionals because they cast considerably further than a regular spinning reel. When Penn came up with these, with these long casts, when I, especially when I'm taking people on the beach, I would spend half the day teaching them how to throw a conventional and I usually had to bring an extra spool of line with me because after the first one, and I call professional overruns, when the bird's nest is about this high coming off the reel, you're, you're cutting and slicing and re-spooling all the time. 
I can get you casting considerable distance with these spinning reels in about 15 minutes because if you can handle a spinning reel you can get some distance out of it because the rods that we're using are I use all 12 footers there's two reasons you don't catch pompano I said it outside you can't reach them or you're fishing in off-color water two of the biggest reasons so with these spinning reels it's it's allowed folks that normally couldn't reach the pompano to reach them it puts you in the game Akuma makes one that we have right there. I see the Akuma right there. Uh, but Penn makes two models that make the Conflict and they also make the uh, Spin Fisher. I like the Spin Fisher because it has seals on it. They call IPX5 seals. They actually seal the drag, they seal the gearbox, and what it does, you spray them off, wipe them down, and put them away, get them serviced once a year. The rods, you want a rod that's, I use all 12 and 13 footers. And the reason, there's a couple reasons for that. Obviously the most obvious is distance. A longer rod, you don't see any commercial guys using seven foot rods. When you walk onto the beach and you see a guy with those four 12 or 13 footers, it's probably a commercial pompano fisherman. So if they're not using a seven foot rod, why aren't they? Because they can't reach the pompano. But the 12-footer also gives you the extended right, and it can be 11-footer, you know, right conditions, right beach. The 12, but the 12-footer I like because what it does, it will put you in the game, it'll get you the distance, but the longer rods do two different, two different, uh, two different uh, purposes also. The longer rod for bite detection, if you ever fish with me, you will see that my rods are set up in a sand spike and by the way I use the 48 inch sand spikes the tall ones by fishing mates because and part of that reason right there these fishing mate sand spikes do a couple different things first of all they're sturdy when that spinner shark grabs your rod and your drag is too tight you don't want to look like a launch center up the road here with your spinning rod going out as it bends down and it's going in the water. But the, these longer sand spikes are much more secure and what happens with them with the 12 foot rod, you're higher in the air. And, and when I say bite detection and line entry, my, all of my rods and reels are set up when they are fishing with the tip tight and bent, not straight up and down. There is no slack. I, I need to see what's going on. So, the 12 footer allows that rod and reel to get, or actually the rod, it allows that line to get into the water because it's winter time, it's not summer where it's flat calm. It will allow the line entry on the higher, higher rod to actually get into the water past the waves. You have beach break waves. You're always going to get some kind of current. The days of flat calm days during the winter when you're popping on fishing is best. There's not too many calm ones. So the longer rod allows your line entry to go over the top of those beach break waves and it will not affect the tension on your line. And the other thing a pompano will do, he will pick your bait up and swim it towards you. If I see a rod, one of my rods straight up and down, two things. Either I miss the bite or there's a fish on. And I've seen some folks fishing next to me. I, I watched a guy one day sit there and watch his rods for about 30 minutes. Had a pompano on the whole time, he never knew it. A lot of people come in the shop and ask about the braid versus mono debate for pompano fishing, right. fishing just because braid's thinner. Do you want right. to address that one? Yes, yeah, I did it before and I'm cool, happy yeah. to do it again. Appreciate it. Um, braided line, one of the best attributes of that and why people buy that is because, number one, it's a small diameter with a higher breaking strength, but the casting distance you pick up with braid, you can cast further. Why I don't like it, it does because of that feature of the braided line, it will actually walk your sinker out of the bottom because it has no stretch. And the monofilm being softer has a little more stretch. We have a lot of cracked shells here. 
and the braid with a with a slight imperfection in it or a crack is probably going to break. The mono, you got a better chance. You have a much better chance. But the braid basically does not allow any stretch, and it will actually move your bait off the bottom. And Pompano do not like a moving bait when they're bait fishing. When you use those types of spikes, do you set your reel down in that? Okay. Or do you have it up? Uh, another good question. Obviously, that's the cutout for the reel. Yeah, but I notice if I have one, I notice the rod goes down quite a bit. Okay. This is what I'm going to tell you to do. If you look at all mine in the truck outside, I have drilled a hole right underneath where it sits. And the reason for that is it sits up higher. And I put a stainless steel screw, or even in a couple situations out there, I even put a zip tie through. But what I don't like it sitting down that far. So I want that extra because if actually yeah, if you're, you're allowed, losing a couple feet. Actually you're gonna lose every you're gonna lose at least eighteen inches. I want those eighteen inches up here. Yeah. So I actually I drill a hole in it and I I have a, a stainless like a set screw that you tighten down on the rod, or oh no, it's 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 just a, it's a bolt, it's just a bolt with a with a lock washer on it. Like a rod holder in a bolt. Okay, it's exactly so actually right. the, the the butt of your rod is somewhere inside yeah. of here. Right in here. Cool. Yep, and it sits up that much higher. And the nice thing about these these type right here, they are strong. When yeah. that spinner shark hits that. This isn't going to bend over. It's easy to get in too when, you're, when you is have a lot of rocks. Or is it a slight angle? I put just a very slight angle going towards the ocean. Just, I don't like them straight up and down. It's a little too affected by the wind. So I just, on a, on, you'll see all of mine are just pointing down just a tad is what it comes to. But a good question about that. But that extra height, believe it or not, you're biting. Yeah, down. well, we, he, he had uh, the old style um, PVC ones, mm -hmm. and I, I just seen these, and I was like, I like this fact that you know you can step on them and get them in the ground. Yep. But that's the first thing I we noticed. I'm like, my 12 foot rod is not 12 foot anymore. You know, his, you know, his was definitely sitting higher. That, that, that's a great point, and that's exactly, boy, I tell you what, your your hookup ratio by seeing it that way and sitting that much higher, your lines going in further out, everything that you're trying to do is enhanced because yeah oh otherwise you know you're you're down here somewhere yeah so if you, but if you do that you you won't and you won't lose your rod because there's enough these are sturdy enough that they're not going to bend on you you know it's it's going to take the brunt of it even with the extended length on the rod good question so where would you put the hole on that one i think mine are down maybe six inches eight inches down so it, it sits up pretty high that's pretty long yeah, that's that's fine. That's fine. But, that's fine. but you're getting that all that extra. It's almost like fishing with a 14 foot rod because you're that high out of the water. Lines going in that much further out, so you're not affected by the waves. But yeah, it and it will. These are sturdy as can be. They are not going to bend on you like the PVCs or some of the some of the lesser type uh, sand spikes. But 48 inches is minimum on a sand spike. Do you want to talk a little bit about? You know, maybe some mackerel and bluefish and other alternatives. Sure, sure absolutely. Just touch like on. I said, there's, you know, these pompano, they're not going to bite every day, all day. But the nice thing about fishing in our area uh, is we have some other species during this time of year. We have a lot of species during this time of year. Uh, Spanish mackerel and bluefish, fun to catch. Uh, Spanish mackerel, excellent eating as long as you don't freeze them, as far as I'm concerned. And they're, they're great on the, on the smoker. Uh, I always keep a rod set up, a small rod, a seven footer, with a spoon or something called a bobber rig. Uh, and the spoon, and I've got one, I think we got one rig right here, don't we? Yep. Okay, spoon just like this, with a loop knot on it. You see those, the mackerel, most of the times you're going to see them. They're going to be skyrocketing out of the water. And the other thing is, like I said before, if you see mackerel, there's a good chance you're going to see, you're going to see some pompano. But with the mackerel, throwing a spoon, you can't reel it fast enough. If you slow it down a little bit, you're going to catch bluefish. But the mackerel is just, you cast a feeding fish like you do any time, and it's the time of year where they are going to get more prolific as they move in, into the area. And the other rig that, and especially because 
you guys said your dad from Juno, boy, that pier on that bobber rig, you know, they they put a bobber afloat with about three foot of either 30 or 40 pound mono with a small Clark spoon. Some of the, I've got to know a couple commercial guys that do it from the beach, that's the rig they use. And all you're doing, you're ca the, first of all, the bobber will give you distance. You can, you can cast it, you can get it out. And you are ripping it through the water. These weighted floats that we use for, you know, snook trap and red fishing here in the river, with three foot, with a small Clark spoon, you, down Juno way, they just kill them down there on that pier with that bobber rig. I mean, it's just as popular as can be. And the other one, if, if you can get some small surgical tubing, you can make a mackerel tree, and the same thing there. But if you think you're reeling too fast, you're probably not reeling fast enough because those mackerel, you, you are not gonna outrun a mackerel with a spoon but they're fun to catch, they're great to eat. The key to them, like anything, ice them. I, put, I have ice in, my, in all my coolers that I bring up on the beach. I don't put any seawater in until I catch my first couple fish because you don't need 75 or 78 degree water melting your ice until you got something to melt them for. So then you put two or three inches of, of water in the bottom. Uh, I actually freeze blocks and I, I use blocks on the beach. And the mackerel are, you keep them firm, they're pretty darn good on the grill. I'm, I'm not a fan if you, if you freeze them, they, they get kind of strong. And the bluefish, uh, I'm from New Jersey, and of course the bluefish that we do catch down here are this big. I'm used to catching them this big. And to be quite honest with you, there's a lot more fish I could catch that are a lot better tasting than a bluefish. So unless I need some, or uh, I have some folks that want some for make some smoked fish, if I'm probably releasing most of them. And then, of course, the whiting in the croaker. Uh, again, I mentioned before, I've been catching a big whiting on the long rods. Croaker is starting to show. I caught some croaker this past weekend, good sized ones. We've had some big ones, so it's good. How far out are you casting to catch your permit? Pumping up distance, Pumping 70, up. 70 to 100 yards. Uh, and again, the only thing different I do for when these permit were around, I will tell you, on the strip bait that I use for the uh, for the pompano, I make it a little longer. I might use an inch and a half. The other bait that I will tell you, I've talked about Easy Flea and Yellow Crab for the pompano, and we got some right over there. I caught the last three permit on white crab. That's for some reason that seemed to be the hot bait for those things for those permit. So it's uh, but the permit you're not really fishing for permit unless you want to use a little bit bigger. Bait. The other thing is, if in fact you can catch, because every once in a while you'll bring a crab in, and if there's permit around, break the knuckle off, put the knuckle on there, put it out, and uh, and you can certainly uh, attract a permit. But do well, I don't fish them. The, the guys do. I mean, they skip them. They run around in the boat looking for them. They go up to sailfish flats. You see them jigging here all the time. No. Well, it, it would, it, it would, most of the fellows that do it in the river and gals that do it in the river, they're looking to jig them. But if you see a boat up by Sailfish Flats that's anchored, and you see a boat, a, and you'll know it's a commercial guy, there's going to be about 13 rods set up around them. They are all using regular pompano rigs. So, no, the exact same rig we use in the ocean. Exact same. It's just that they're they're waiting for that school to go by, and believe it or not, you'll get four, five, six rods go up at once. But yes, you can't catch them that way in the river. Mm -hmm. Got a question? What knot do you use between the main line and the shock leader? What what knot do you use between the main line? I'm a blood knot guy. Some some folks uh, I like a blood knot, and the reason I like the blood knot is because the profile on it's a little bit smaller. Some folks use the double uni knot. Uh, those are the two most popular of the people that I know, but I like the blood knot because, boy, that it's a real small profile. I'm not even thinking about getting hung up in any of the guys, but that uh, that knot is a, is, is a good one, a real good one. Good stuff. Anyone else have any questions for Captain Paul? Do you bleed out the pump? I don't, because they're they're cold, and I, I will tell you this, um, commercially they want them cold, 
And if you do what I said, if you if, or mentioned that you do, keep that ice in your cooler, then put some salt water in when you first when you caught a couple and make sure they're in that kind of slushy. They will stay perfect. And when I take my every once in a while, they'll stick them over here. And, and I've never taken a fish over there that was above 37 degrees. So. Uh, there's, there's folks that bleed everything. I, mean, I can't be a bad thing, but I've seen that meat when they fillet some of my fish over there, and it looks awful good. Just keep them cold. The whole that's the key to anything here. Just keep them cold. Anything else you want to go over? All good. Just want to say thank you to Captain Paul for coming out to our first. <laughs> Cheese guys, hey. live seminar. What? We apologize for the weather, but we appreciate you all tuning in on Facebook Live. Throw, we encourage throw you all to come out to our more next personal. seminar on December 3rd at 5.30 p.m. That's going to be on a Thursday as well. Um, that's going to be with our Shimano rep, John Allen, and local inshore guide, Ed Zayak. Thank you all. Hope to see you soon. Yeah, uh, and Freddie and I, we, we may reschedule and do another one.